Did Elon light $44 billion on fire? Is Twitter just the billionaire's version of Fire Festival? Let's find out. Today, we're gonna to talk about Elon buying Twitter. My take is that Elon buying Twitter, it's like he ripped the Band-Aid off a patient and it may or may not kill it. You know, we're kind of like seeing what happens. Maybe the billionaire version of Fire Festival. We don't, <laughs> we don't know. I mean, there's a lot like what's good and what's bad about this, right? Like the good part, everybody in Silicon Valley, like every executive, every founder, they might not admit it, but they've all been looking at the bloat in Silicon Valley and the bloated headcount and saying, hmm, does this make sense? But the problem is it's endemic to Silicon Valley. So the reason is, if you think about it, there's certain companies that are very profitable in Silicon Valley, and those drive the whole ecosystem. Companies like Google, Microsoft, et cetera. And these companies, because they've been so profitable, they can number one, pay huge salaries, and number two, have huge organizations. And so the most profitable companies kind of set the tone and what happens is that culture trickles down to the mid-sized companies. They go, it starts at the Metas, Googles of the world, and Microsofts, and then it trickles down to the Ubers and Twitters of the world, and then it trickles down to all the startups, right? And the reason is because like, why should a company that is maybe much less profitable, like an Uber compared to Google, still have the same type of hiring plan as a Google? Well, it's one, part of the culture in Silicon Valley, and two, it's part of the competitive nature of Silicon Valley. It's like, if you're recruiting talent into Uber, right? Let's say they're recruiting a PM, like a group PM. You know, that group PM is gonna to wanna to know, well, is my organization gonna grow? Is my authority gonna grow? And that generally manifests itself as having a bigger team, right? And so that's why you've had this cascading balloon in Silicon Valley. In addition to that, you've layered it on top of this massive overinvestment in Silicon Valley over the last 10 years. You had this really low interest rate environment. People were looking for anything that was gonna grow. So you had all these dollars flowing into Silicon Valley, hundreds of billions of dollars of venture capital. And that has made it easy for people to expand their team and grow their team. Like when we were building Atrium, I hired 180 people in two years because I was able to raise $75 million for a business with very questionable margins. And that's just because people were investing a lot of money in a lot of things. And we were looking around and saying, oh, well, this is the price of office space. This is the price of engineers. This is just the price of operating in the Silicon Valley Bay Area. Where does that leave us? Twitter has become over the last you know, 10 years, they've grown to 7,400 people or something like that. And, you know, everyone's kind of looking around and like, is this necessary to run this company? And at the same time, a series of events got Elon interested in buying the company, right? Elon's always been an avid Twitter user. Twitter, in a way, has been responsible for some of his success. So Elon has gone like Tesla stock is like the number one meme stock, right? Elon is an amazing showman. He releases all sorts of like content on Twitter, like whether it's a humanoid robot or Cybertruck videos or doing live streams of SpaceX. You know, he had this rabid Twitter fan base ever before he got interested in buying Twitter, he was, you know, had tens of millions of followers on Twitter. And these are the same type of people who are like on Wall Street bets being like, right. Tesla's going to the moon, you gotta invest in Tesla. And that gave him a huge amount of capital to actually build the products that Tesla has created. But so Twitter has been this huge aid to Elon's career and he's been interested in it. And so at the same time, I think Elon is kind of one of these, you know, original Gen X or millennial founders who started off being very centrist, very much like a classic liberal, someone who's like, you know, believes in the values in the constitution. Like when we started off making, you know, the Twitches, Reddits of the world, et cetera, it was all about like free speech and people should be able to say what they want on the internet. And there's kind of like this, you should be able to do what you want online unless it's explicitly prohibited by law. The industry has matured and it's become big business, right? So like these companies, they don't want to censor speech, but they just don't want to have controversial stuff on the platform because it annoys advertisers. And so they're willing to kick people off for things that go against kind of the mainstream orthodoxy. Anything that's going to create friction, they're like, eh, do we really need to deal with this, right? So you have people on YouTube saying things that go against the party line on COVID, for example, and then people say, oh, it's COVID and misinformation, YouTube bans it, they don't want to deal. It might be true, it might not be, but it's like not worth it to fight for it. So Elon had purportedly become interested in free speech on Twitter after the Babylon Bee, which is a kind of conservative onion-like parody uh, news site, was banned from Twitter for saying uh, Rachel Levine, who is a um, government official, and a transgender woman said that she was man of the year. What? You know, which is kind of rude, but should they be able to say it? I don't know, but they were banned by the previous Twitter regimes. Now, Elon, who's a purported free speech absolutist, was like, that's fucked up. And that's when he started getting interested in buying Twitter stock. Amasses just under 10% position in Twitter secretly, and then he announces that he had it. And then earlier this spring, he says, I want to buy Twitter and makes a tender offer for like $54.20 a share, which is just about $44 billion for the whole company. 
company. And then he's like, tries to back out of the deal and says that Twitter has a huge bot problem and the company won't announce how many bots there are, won't give him accurate data. So he's trying to like back out of it, but the company sues him to complete the deal. And then eventually he capitulates and ends up buying Twitter for $44 billion, of which $13 billion is debt. So this adds a billion dollars a year of debt service to Twitter. So Twitter has to pay existing operating costs, but they have to pay an extra billion dollars a year on top of that. Then Twitter is an unprofitable company. Now this puts a timeline on Elon of like, he's gotta figure it out pretty quickly, otherwise the company could go bankrupt because now not only do they have the 5 billion or so of costs that they have already, I think it was like 1 billion server costs, 4 billion people. They also have this additional billion dollars of debt service. Elon does a number of very controversial things. First off, he comes in and he just says he's gonna lay off a shit ton of people. Now, Twitter management was already gonna lay off people, but because Elon has started to be maligned by the elite establishment that exists on Twitter, Elon says that he's going to change verification so that instead of being like a notable person, all you have to do is pay $8 a month and then you'll be verified. And of course, everybody who has a verification badge starts going up in arms because they're like, this is gonna create, it's chaos. Anyone's gonna be able to say they're verified and it's gonna create a massive amount of confusion. And you know, maybe there's a little bit of people who have the verification badge feeling like they're no longer gonna be special. I don't know. So Elon, after he buys the company, he comes in, he's got David Sachs, Jason Kalkanis, Yuram Krishnan from A16Z, a bunch of friends coming in to help him and he brings in an army of SpaceX and Tesla engineers and executives who come in to help him figure out what's going on. And they immediately start cutting costs, they're making lists of who's gonna stay. You know, there's a huge amount of uncertainty inside the company, but because it's Twitter, all of this uncertainty is projected online and everybody is kind of like freaking out online. You know, they're like, what's gonna happen? And every politician, every business person takes the opportunity to jump on and just give their opinion on what's going to happen a lot of which is negative. People are rooting for Elon to fail because this is like their moment to project whatever their beliefs are on top of Elon. You know, all of a sudden he's like a terrible capitalist. He's like against workers, you know, free speech absolutist, but it's gonna allow misinformation to run rampant on the platform. You know, whatever their worst, deepest fears for the platform are, they're spreading it out all over Twitter. When Elon comes in, some people immediately start quitting. Other people get fired after they talk shit to Elon. This creates this huge wave of people online saying, oh, he's too sensitive and you can't take a joke when I'm to free speech and other people saying you can't insult your boss it's fucked up you know they should be fired but everything every move that happens inside of twitter is this like massive shitstorm. you know there's reporters outside of twitter looking and waiting for people who have been fired to come out so they can kind of report on this narrative this week elon emails the entire staff and says if you want to keep your job you have to click yes here on this form and by clicking this form you agree that you're going to be willing to work long hours and become extra hardcore or you get three months severance reportedly 75 percent of the remaining Twitter employees did not click that button. And so we don't really know what's going to happen. This could be the case where the company has gone from 7,500 people or thereabouts to less than a thousand people in less than a month, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. The most aggressive might be 50% if you expect the company to keep surviving. And so really this is kind of a test on like, does institutional knowledge matter at all? Or can you survive as a company kind of with zero based accounting, cutting the whole team and almost starting from scratch? I don't know what the answer is, but it's kind of amusing to watch. I think Elon is doing some things that are really good. Number one, he's resetting the culture on how fast they can move. So I think that's really interesting because the company had slowed to a crawl. Innovation was just not happening and thousands of people, they were getting not that much done. And I think that to pick on Twitter, that's true of many companies in Silicon Valley. So he's resetting the pace of innovation. Uh, number two, I think he's thinking outside the box. He's been talking about, you know, user payments and how they want to shift from advertising to a model that includes, you know, much more user payments. And I think that's really interesting. You know, you had all these things come up like Patreon, OnlyFans, Twitch that have like lots of user payments. The reason Twitter can't be similar to that. I think there's no fundamental reason. So I like that he's kind of forcing people to think about new directions for the product. What's tough about what he's doing, I think culturally, this is a huge shock to the system. And it could be the case that like 95% of people quit Twitter. And while the site is probably not going to go down overnight, you know, he could have significant problems in the short term in retaining and recruiting talent. I do think that there's probably a flag that's gone up of like people who want to work hard and people who want to be in an environment where they're just like really challenged. And so maybe you'll attract those people. And I think that's what's really worked well at SpaceX or Tesla. The blue check thing is an interesting way to try to monetize. It's a good idea if you need to raise cash really quickly. There were obviously problems where people were starting to impersonate actual companies. One guy was like impersonated a pharma company. It was like the price of insulin is going to now be 
free and their stock crashed $8 billion overnight. And then there were people who impersonated Lockheed and people who impersonated Nintendo. And there was a lot of like tweets that were kind of, you know, rocky. You know, he's rolling things out fast and there's speed bumps, you know, some significant speed bumps. Overall, I think getting people to pay to opt in for their blue check is not a bad idea, but it just depends on like how many people you can get to, to do that. I do think banning, he was going to say, oh yeah, everyone who has an existing blue check has to pay. And I think a lot of those people will not pay just for spite, which is actually negative because the reason that you would want a blue check is because other people have blue checks. He should actually grandfather in all the blue checks to not pay, I think, right now, but making everyone pay is short-sighted. The one Twitter feature I think he should build, I think his user payments is really interesting. And um, Twitter, I think there's a lot that they can do there. My conclusion is I'm super fascinated to see what happens. Everybody in Silicon Valley, all these entrepreneurs and investors are rooting for Elon because they love the idea of resetting the culture to move faster. He's doing it. It might kill the company, but he's doing it. And so everybody's kind of watching and waiting to see what happens. And, you know, personally, I'm rooting for him. The one thing I hate about this entire situation is there's this huge amount of people online now that are rooting for Elon's downfall. But aside from that, they're also rewriting history. You know, they're saying, oh, Elon is just a manager and he didn't do anything to contribute to SpaceX and Tesla's success, which is like completely bullshit. This is the guy who slept on the factory floor in Tesla to make it work and talks about chewing glass and staring into the abyss. Elon, out of all people in the world, is like one of the most hardcore founders. And, and he is someone who really puts his money where his mouth is. He doesn't ask other people to do what he's not willing to do. He's just willing to do an incredible amount. But there's a lot of people who don't like Elon now who are being intellectually dishonest and they're like willing to kind of rewrite history and like try to take credit away from him. If you think about it, Elon is the person who's done the most for climate change of all living human beings. Basically, fast forward the electric car, the auto industry transition to electric cars, electric vehicles in a way that nobody else was doing. You can hate his style and think he's an asshole, but at the same time, give him credit for what he has done.